Before we talk about CPAP, let's talk about the anatomy of the respiratory system. It's very important to understand the anatomy and physiology behind certain body systems, especially when you're going to be doing a procedure or giving medications that may affect those body systems. If you don't really truly understand what the norm is for that system, then you're not really going to understand what you're doing for the patient, which is obviously not ideal. So on the left hand side you see a picture and that picture is a cross section of the lung and you will notice that the lung isn't just one giant balloon right it's a lot of tissue and there's quite a bit of surface area in there and we'll look at a uh, at a more microscopic uh, section of the lung here shortly um, but that's just a cross section an overview and i just really wanted you to understand how dense and how uh, how much tissue is really behind the lung itself on the right hand side you'll see just a picture of the respiratory system as a whole and i kind of want to just um, show you how the air comes into the body. So air comes into the body, uh, it goes into the trachea. Now the trachea, there's two tubes in your neck. There's the trachea and the esophagus. The trachea is gonna be the most anterior portion, so that's the tube that's closest to the front of your body, and the esophagus is directly behind it. The esophagus is very um, muscular, and it's all tissue. There's no um, cartilage, or there are no bones in the esophagus. Now, when it comes to the trachea itself, there's a bunch of rings that line the trachea, and these rings are, are a C-shape. And that lines the trachea all the way down. So the trachea kind of comes down, and at some point here, it actually bifurcates, or it splits off into two separate sections. And these two sections here are called the bronchi. Now these bronchi are what help um, split the air into the separate lungs. From the bronchi, these passages get smaller and smaller. And as they get smaller, they kind of get into areas called the alveoli. And the alveoli are air-filled sacs. Oftentimes, they're described as air-filled sacs. And these air-filled sacs are where gas exchange happens. And these, these alveoli are all over your lung. So in this big picture over here on the left-hand side, there's thousands and thousands of alveoli in that. They're just extremely small. And what they have going for them is because there are so many, there's a lot of surface area for gas exchange to happen. And we'll explain that here in just a second. So these two pictures are probably my favorite pictures so far that I found of the respiratory system because I believe it really helps you understand um, the lung tissue and the internal structures of the different passages into the lung as well. So on the left hand side is a blown up picture of actual lung tissue. There's a big hole there in the center and that big hole is actually going to be a bronchial. So that's what's bringing the air into that tissue. Now all these other little holes over here around it, so all these holes around it here, those are actually going to be alveoli. Um, that's, those are the air filled sacs. And what you'll notice is that that picture looks a lot like a sponge. So imagine a sponge. How is a sponge able to hold so much water without really um, emptying it all out or without spilling it all out? Well, it's because of all that surface area and surface tension inside of a sponge. So if you look at a sponge, there's a bunch of holes. It looks a lot like this. And when it goes into the water, there's enough surface area that causes surface tension and that water stays in there. The lungs act very similarly. Because of all this surface area, when we take a breath in, we have plenty of surface area for gas exchange to happen. And that's where it happens. All the gas exchange happens in the tissue in between all those holes there. I thought that was pre pretty interesting. Now on the right hand side is the actual structure, the bronchioles and the bronchi, the structures of the lungs. This is These are the structures that bring the air into your lungs. And what I want you to notice is up here, the trachea is up here. And then you'll notice that the bronchi split off. You'll notice that the right block bronchi, which is this one right over here, is a lot straighter than the left bronchi, okay? And what's super interesting about that is pay attention when you start going on pneumonia patients, you'll notice that a lot more um, of the pneumonia cases that you see out there are gonna be in the right lung. And the reason for that is because it's a straight shot right into the right lung. There's very little turning going on here, right? Whereas in the left lung, there's kind of a large um, turn that goes over to the left, and so oftentimes you find pneumonia more often in the right lung than you see in the left lung. Let's talk about how we actually get air in and out of our lungs. And that's going to be called ventilation. That's the act of getting air in and out of our lungs. 
And these two pictures, I think, do a pretty decent job of showing you how that works. And I'm going to be talking about the one on the left here. So the picture on the left is essentially just a picture of the thoracic cavity itself. Okay, so we have the diaphragm here at the bottom, diaphragm here at the bottom, and then our intercostal muscles here off to the side. So what ends up happening is our diaphragm flattens out, intercostal muscles flare up and out, which essentially causes more volume inside of our chest. And when we do that, we decrease the pressure in our chest. So 760 millimeters of mercury is atmospheric pressure. That's all around us, okay? When we increase the volume of a chest, now we have more volume to fill, right? And so when we do that, the pressure inside of our chest falls to 759 roughly. And what do we know about air? Well, we know that it's going to want to go from high pressure to low pressure. And because the air outside, the pressure outside of our body is higher than the pressure inside of our body, air is going to rush into our lungs. And that is essentially how we get air into our lungs. Now, when we exhale, the opposite is true. So their diaphragm relaxes, intercostal muscles relax, and now what happens is the pressure in our chest goes up to 600, 761 millimeters of mercury. So now the pressure in our chest is actually higher than the pressure outside. And so air is now forced to go outwards in order to equalize, okay? So all this pressure wants to do is essentially equalize. And so when the pressure is less in our chest cavity than it is outside, then the air is gonna go inside to help equalize that pressure. And the same is true um, except opposite when we relax our diaphragm and relax our, our intercostal muscles. So let's talk about gas exchange. What happens to the air once it finally gets into our lungs and over to the alveoli? So remember, air goes into our trachea, that bifurcates or splits off into the bronchi, then down to the bronchioles, and then ultimately down to the alveoli, which is those air-filled sacs. And that's where the gas exchange happens, right? Now those alveoli are actually surrounded by a ton of capillaries. And these capillaries are what facilitate that gas exchange. So this picture on the left-hand side here, you'll see deoxygenated blood coming in. And this deoxygenated blood wants to get rid of, our, of the carbon dioxide. So there's a bunch of O2 in here right now in the alveoli. And that wants to get into the blood cells. So currently the blood cells have CO2. Once it gets into this area, it releases the CO2 into the alveoli and all of this O2, all of this oxygen that's in the alveoli now has a chance to go ahead and go inside the red blood cells. And once it's in the red blood cells, now those capillaries can carry that now newly oxygenated blood into the pulmonary veins and back into our heart where then it is pumped throughout our body and is able to be used appropriately. This picture on the right is just another technical, uh, more precise picture of exactly the same thing. But something I kind of wanted to show you, that cross section of the lung that I had showed you earlier, that blown up uh, cross section of the lung that looked like a sponge, that essentially is gonna be all of this here, okay? Remember that big hole that we saw in the middle? That is going to be these bronchioles, okay? And then all those little tiny holes around the bronchioles are going to be the alveoli. That's all of this, and this is what it's going to look like. That's essentially what we saw. Now that we have a pretty good understanding of the anatomy and physiology with the respiratory system, let's talk about some complications that we're going to be experiencing in patients out in the field. And these four diseases are the pretty, pretty common ones that we're going to see when running patients and ones that we're probably going to have to intervene on uh, in some way, shape, or form. So the first one we're going to talk about is bronchitis. And bronchitis is a chronic inflammation of the lining of the bronchioles. Remember, the bronchioles are those tubes that bring air into the alveoli. And what happens is over, uh, over time, from either smoking or other environmental factors like um, like where people may work or where they live, um, they end up getting this chronic inflammation of the bronchioles. And because 
we have this chronic inflammation. We have mucus um, that ends up forming. The bronchial tube itself gets smaller, so the pathogens get, get smaller because of the inflammation of the actual lining of the bronchioles. And then with this, we also get a lot of infection. So imagine you have all of this that you're seeing, the mucus, the inflammation of the actual lining of the bronchioles. Air isn't able to get in and out as well as it, it should. And if we inhale some sort of pathogen, it's going to love this type of environment. It's a warm, moist, dark environment with mucus. And so oftentimes these patients get a lot of pneumonia. Well, what that pneumonia does is that also in increases the inflammation and the swelling of the bronchioles because as your body tries to heal itself, it's gonna have a lot of scar tissue that ends up forming. So not only do these patients have problems with chronic inflammation, but they also have chronic illness like pneumonia, which ultimately ends up exacerbating the issue even further. The second one that we're gonna talk about is emphysema. Now emphysema actually involves the alveoli itself. And what ends up happening is because of the same type of environmental factors like smoking, where they work, where they live, um, we end up getting a breakdown of the alveoli walls. So remember those alveoli are those air-filled sacs, right? And we need those walls because that's where the gas exchange happens. Where over time, those walls begin to break down and now we have less surface area um, for gas exchange to happen. And not only that, but because these walls break down, now the structure of the alveoli isn't as strong as it should be. And so the alveoli want to actually collapse on themselves. And when they collapse, they're really, really hard to get back open. And that's further gonna exacerbate the, the difficulty breathing and the gas exchange problems. And I kind of equate this to um, the, the sponge idea. So here's a picture of a sponge. Again, um, you know, you can see all the holes in there. There's a lot of surface area that can allow for that absorption of water, right? Now imagine that we cut the inside of that sponge out. We still have the general structure and the general size of that sponge, but I think you would agree that now we have a lot less surface area for gas exchange to end up happening. And so with that, we're gonna have further complications. The third one we're gonna talk about is asthma. Asthma is a really common one, especially in the pediatric population. Asthma and bronchitis are kind of similar. It involves inflammation of the bronchioles. We have the swelling of the lining of the bronchioles and we have mucus buildup as well. But the difference is, is typically with asthma, it's brought on by some sort of allergen. So what ends up happening is your body is always trying to fight off allergens and pathogens, right? Now people who have asthma, or more susceptible um, to, to become exacerbated or to get kind of their body kind of freaks out when it's faced with a certain pathogen. So what ends up happening is these people who have asthma, they go out, um, maybe there's a high pollen level that one day and their lungs essentially freak out. So it's your body's immune system kind of freaking out with things. It's similar to like an anaphylactic reaction or even sepsis, right? Your body is freaking out about something and it overreacts. And so with asthma, the way it overreacts is it causes swelling of the pathogens of the bronchioles and it causes mucus buildup as well. And that prevents air from getting into the alveoli for that proper gas exchange. And the third one that we're finally, or fourth one we're finally gonna talk about is pulmonary edema. And that essentially is just fluid in, in the lungs. And so what happens is there's fluid either in the alveoli or between the capillaries and the alveoli. And so air is able to get into our body, into our lungs, but the problem is, is that air isn't able to jump that liquid barrier um, in through the alveoli and into the capillary and get into the, uh, that blood to oxygenate it. And so that gets us to CPAP. Why is CPAP important? Well, one of the reasons is it increases our O2 delivery. Now think about that. We can apply a non-rebreather to a patient 15 liters per minute, and that's essentially 100% oxygen. Good job, you've actually applied 100% oxygen to this patient. Here's the issue. If this patient has COPD, emphysema, bronchitis, pneumonia, asthma, right? That means that there's some of that oxygen is not getting to where it needs to breathe. Now, CPAP can increase that O2 delivery. So not only does it get it into the patient, but it's gonna push it to where it actually needs to go, which is in the alveoli, so that there can be gas exchange happening. It's also going to decrease our work of breathing. And I really wanna underscore that, okay? We wanna decrease anybody's work of breathing. 
If a patient is working hard to breathe because they're having a respiratory issue, ultimately they're gonna to get to the point where they stop working so hard to breathe because they're tired. And when that happens, this patient is going to go into respiratory arrest and then probably soon after that into cardiac arrest. And that's going to be a whole other issue that we don't ever wanna to have to get into. And it's gonna also decrease our overall mortality rate. And I'll touch about on that on the secondary goals here. CPAP also acts as a pneumatic stent. So think about a cardiac patient. Now we have a patient who is having a heart attack. They get shipped into the hospital, they go into the cath lab, and in the cath lab they add a stent into the coronary artery. And what that stent does is it opens up that coronary artery and keeps it open so that we oxygenated blood can get through there and into the part of the heart that needs that blood. Essentially CPAP does the same thing except it uses pressure. And that pressure is used during inhalation, but also during exhalation. And what that does is it keeps those airways, those passages open. So um, the alveoli that want to collapse because a patient has emphysema or the really tight passages like you know, patients with asthma or chronic bronchitis, what CPAP is going to do is going to open up those passages, um, allow for that gas exchange to happen, and it's going to decrease a patient's work of breathing. Another great thing that it does is it actually helps recruit alveoli. So there are alveoli in our body that we don't always use, okay? We have a thousands and thousands of thousands of alveoli, and normally we don't have to use them all, okay? And so what CPAP does, because of the increased pressure in our chest and into the lungs, we're actually going to help I say kind of wake up some of these dormant alveoli that haven't been used either ever or haven't been used in a long time. And hopefully those alveoli aren't as injured or they don't have as many issues as the other alveoli that are used more often. So it's gonna help increase um, the recruitment of the alveoli as well. Another great thing that it does is it's going to improve the delivery of bronchial dilators by 80%. So think about this, by the time we get called to a patient's house that has COPD, asthma. Um, the, typically they call because the difficulty breathing has increased, right? They've already taken their, their inhaler, they've already done their nebulizers probably all day, and it's just not working. Why? The reason it's not working is because they are so tight, those passages are so tight that any medication they try to inhale isn't getting to where it needs to be, okay? And so, if we can apply a CPAP to help force those passages open and then give them a medication so that way they can inhale that medication and it's gonna to get to where it needs to be, that's gonna be a lot better for this patient. Now, some of the other goals are, it's gonna decrease the need of emergent intubations. The way we used to deal with these patients in the field is a non-rebreather, um, a nebulizer, we'd bag them, or we'd have to intubate them in the field. Either way, we'd ship them quickly to the hospital, and by the time they got to the hospital, they would need to be intubated, and they would be put on a ventilator. And what we know about patients that are put on ventilators is, they typically don't do very well, okay? Especially patients with other comorbidities. So we're not intubating healthy people, we're intubating patients who have COPD exacerbation, right? And we weren't able to fix them in the field. By the time they get to the hospital, they're doing worse. They intubate them so they can stabilize this patient, and then they put them on a, on a ventilator. Well, typically either the patients become um, used to that ventilator and it's hard to get them off of it, or, um, they end up getting secondary infections because of being on a ventilator like pneumonia. And so ultimately that what that would do is that would increase our hospital stay, okay? So now though, with, with the invention of CPAP, typically these patients are a lot better by the time they get to the hospital. They get to the hospital, maybe get a couple more medications, and then some of these patients are actually being discharged that same day. But it's important that we put CPAP on a patient early so that way we can um, keep them from uh, further deteriorating. Let's talk about indications and contraindications in regards to CPAP usage. And before I get into the indications and contraindications, I first wanna point something out. When it comes to contraindications, keep in mind that if the patient meets any one of the contraindications, the patient is automatically not a candidate for CPAP. Now, conversely, the patient does not need 
to meet all of the indications in order to be a candidate for CPAP. So with that being said, let's go into the indications. One of the indications is severe respiratory distress, and that's a very broad statement, right? Because we understand that there's multiple things that can cause respiratory distress, okay? The second one is where a lot of people kind of get hung up on, and this says hypoxia essentially in the place of supplemental oxygen. So we have a patient with a pulse oximetry of 92% uh, or lower, despite having uh, supplemental oxygen applied and that would make them a candidate for CPAP. Now with that being said, understand that pulse oximetry is just a tool and it should never take the place of your good clinical judgment. Understand that the whole point of CPAP is to decrease the work of breathing. The way I always explain this to students is just because their oxygen is high, if they're working to maintain that oxygen level, then they're going to get tired eventually. And when they become tired, that oxygen level is going to drop like a rock. And unfortunately, the patient may quickly turn into a patient that is no longer a candidate for CPAP because you allowed it to go for too long, right? So let's make it easier for them to maintain that oxygen instead of waiting for them, okay, to drop off into the deep end. A lot of people get caught up on that number, the 92% or the supplemental oxygen. Understand that. Again, the whole point of CPAP is to decrease the work of breathing. We don't ever want to uh, allow the patient to have a hard time breathing for an extended period of time. That's a terrible idea, okay? So uh, the third one is acute exacerbation of asthma or COPD. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. I kind of already explained all the different pathophysiologies with that. Uh, the fourth one is gonna be pulmonary edema and near drowning. Now, keep in mind, we have a patient in the, that we pulled out of the Grand River, they may be breathing okay initially, but if they've inhaled any water whatsoever, that water starts breaking down the alveoli or it's essentially the surfactant. So there's a fluid um, that lines the, the, the walls of the alveoli. And what that fluid does is it helps keep those alveoli open. And if we inhale any kind of water, what that water does is that will wash away that surfactant causing a collapse in the alveoli and then ultimately causing a hard time breathing or exacerbation of difficulty breathing, okay? So if we get to a patient who we just recently pulled out of a river or recently pulled out of any kind of water source and they've potentially inhaled some water, then it would be a good idea to go ahead and give them a CPAP uh, to prevent the collapse or the potential collapse of um, the OVLI. Okay, let's get into the contraindications. The first two are the respiratory and cardiac arrest, okay? Keep in mind that CPAP is only indicated for an alert patient who is breathing by themselves. They actually have to initiate every breath, okay? If they're not, then we need to start ventilating them with a bag valve mask. So a cardiac arrest patient, a respiratory arrest patient is no longer a candidate for CPAP. We hope to apply the CPAP to the patient prior to them getting to that point. Uh, the second one is a really big one as well, and that's a blood pressure less than 90. Um, and the reason that's important is remember, when we take that deep breath in, we are now um, decreasing the pressure in our chest. And when we decrease the pressure in our chest, air gets uh, sucked in and that's how we end up getting air, right? Well, the cool thing about that is when we decrease the pressure in our chest for that moment of time, we're also helping suck blood back into our heart as well, which is also in our chest, right? So when we apply CPAP, now we have a constant pressure in the chest. And that constant pressure is great because it helps force air into the lungs and open up the alveoli and the other passages. But it also will help drop blood pressure because now that vena cava, which is that large vessel that brings deoxygenated blood back into the heart, and again, that's a vein, so that's a low pressure system, right? That vena cava has to now fight against that increased pressure in our chest to bring that blood back into our heart. So that can be a little bit of a detriment. So it's essential that we take a blood pressure prior to applying CPAP. Now, with that being said, we don't necessarily need a full systolic and diastolic blood pressure, okay? If we get to a patient and we believe they're a candidate for CPAP, they're probably really having a hard time breathing and it's essential that we get going quickly, right? So 
what I really am looking for is a systolic blood pressure, which you can very easily get with a palpated blood pressure, okay? So a palpated blood pressure, a systolic blood pressure of 90 or above, and we're, we're golden. A patient who's unresponsive to speech is going to be contraindicated for CPAP. And the reason for that is we want a patient that not only is breathing on their own, but is able to also protect their own airway. If this patient is so altered that they can't protect their own airway, that tongue can fall behind their behind their throat, occlude the airway, or if they end up vomiting, they're not gonna know enough to try to um, pull a CPAP away from their mouth or to get onto their side so they so that can come out of their mouth, right? So it's important that this patient is able to protect their own airway. So a, a, an unresponsive patient to speech is not that type of patient. Uh, an inability to maintain that patent airway, which I just touched on, major trauma, pneumothorax, or penetrating chest trauma. So if we have any kind of chest trauma, now we have some instability in the chest cavity, a pneumothorax, um, we definitely don't want to uh, apply CPAP. Remember, that's in increasing the pressure in our chest. If we have a hole in one of our lungs and all that air that we're inhaling is going into our chest and we apply CPAP, we're only going to make things way worse for that patient. A patient who's actively vomiting or actively has a GI bleed that's coming out of their mouth, we're not going to want to put a CPAP on because remember that that mask goes right over their mouth and they're not going to be able to um, clear that airway as easily. And then a patient with unstable facial fractures, okay? We get to a patient, they have a Lafort 1, 2, or 3 fracture. They have these fractures in their, in their face, their nose, and their, um, their cheekbones are very unstable. Then we're not going to want to put a CPAP on them because when we try to put that CPAP, we want a good seal, and we're going to probably be strapping that on tight enough to maintain that seal. If they have a lot of unstable fractures, we're not going to be able to maintain a good seal. It's going to be extremely painful for the, for the patient, and we can cause a lot of issues as well. Now that we understand the importance of CPAP, let's talk about the actual application of the CPAP device. First, we need to confirm the patient is a candidate, that the patient doesn't meet any of the contraindications that would exclude them from getting the device. Once we've done that, we need to now do a good job explaining the procedure. Understand that these patients are a difficulty breathing patient, right? I equate them to a drowning patient. When you have a drowning patient, the only thing they, they can think of is breathing and getting away from wherever they're at, right? And it, the same is true for a difficulty breathing patient, a respiratory distress patient. All they can think about is getting oxygen and survival, right? And so when we explain this procedure, we need to not only let them know that we're going to apply a CPAP device, but we need to let them know what to expect and we really need to sell them this device, right? We need to convince them that this is gonna be the best thing for them because it can be a little bit scary. We have a patient who now is having a hard time breathing and we're gonna put a mask over the, their face. And that can be really, really scary for any kind of patient, especially a patient who is having respiratory distress. So we need to sell it to them. Once we sell them this device, we need, let's get a set of vitals as well. And hopefully we have a partner with us that can be getting a set of vitals while we're explaining the device and setting it up all at the same time. So we're explaining the device, letting them know that it's going to help them breathe a lot easier. It's going to help with their work of breathing, right? And it's going to make them feel a lot better. Also let them know that they may feel a little claustrophobic, but we're going to do this together. Let them know that they're going to feel pressure and air rushing towards their face and that it's going to help open up their lungs so that way we can potentially give them some more uh, medication. We get the set of vitals, make sure that they meet the 90 systolic criteria, and then we prepare the CPAP and apply it to oxygen. We want to make sure that we plug it into our oxygen tank and start at 10 liters per minute. Let's start that prior to putting it on their face, right? We want oxygen going through that mask before putting it on their face. It's already scary enough as it is, and if we put a mask on their face that has no oxygen coming through, they're going to freak out quite quickly. So apply um, oxygen to the O2 port. Um, 10 liters per minute is a good starting point, and then we want to put it up onto their face. And what I like to do is have them help you with that. With one hand, I bring it up to their face. I tell them to help me put it onto their face. And we just kind of sit there and talk for a second. Make sure that they're going to be able to handle it. And we want to adjust the flow to patient improvement, okay? So what we're looking for at 10 liters per minute and putting it up to the face is we want a number on the manometer, which is this dial device over here on the right-hand side. We want a number of around five centimeters of 
of water, okay? And remember that the only time you're going to be able to read this little dial right here, the only time you're going to be able to read that is when they exhale, okay? When they inhale, it's probably gonna go down to zero. When they exhale is when you're taking your reading. And you want a number around five. It may be a little bit lower, it may be a little bit higher. Every patient's different, so starting at 10 is a good starting point. And remembering the number five is a really good starting point too. Once you get to that area, ask the patient, how does that feel? Do you feel like you're having a better time breathing? Is that easier for you? If they say it's too much pressure, then bring the oxygen level down. If they say it's not enough, then go ahead and bring it up, okay? It's all about patient comfort and making sure that we're having good patient improvement, okay? So keep an eye on that manometer, keep an eye on your oxygen level, and keep an eye on that patient. Remember, constant reassurance is gonna be needed, especially if they've never had a CPAP device applied to them before. One of the first things I like to do when I'm explaining the procedure is asking the patient, have you ever had CPAP applied before? If they say yes, then all the hard work is pretty much done for you. You just need to put it on. If they say no, then you need to start selling on the device, okay? Also, there's some patients that have had it on and they know exactly what manometer level or reading uh, it works best for them, uh, or they know what pressure in general works best for them, okay? So don't be afraid to ask, okay, hey, was there a certain pressure that worked better for you? If they don't know, then just start at the 10 liters per minute and look for a number around five. Let's discuss fitting the CPAP. Do you notice that the CPAP mask has this net that goes behind the head and clips into the side of the mask here and another one over here. Another thing you may notice is there's a forehead pad there and it's a little hard to see, but right here is a little slide that you can slide up and down, which essentially what that does is move the forehead pad up and down. When applying the CPAP and fitting it appropriately, I said that I like to um, put the CPAP up to the patient's face, sit there for a little bit, um, make sure that they're gonna tolerate it, and then finish applying the CPAP altogether. And the way I do that is I like to disconnect only one side. So I disconnect one side and flap that netting over to the side. I apply it to the patient's face, and once I've determined that they're going to tolerate that, then I go ahead, let them know that I'm going to clip it onto that side, and then there's Velcro here, here, a Velcro tab that you can unvelcro and pull tight. Well, now when we do that, oftentimes patients will complain that there's a lot of pressure on the nose itself, okay? So they'll say that there was a bunch of pressure right on the nose. And in, in order to combat that, you will need to utilize this slide right here to essentially apply more pressure on the forehead pad. The more pressure you can apply on that forehead pad, that the less pressure they'll feel here in the nose area, okay? So it takes a little uh, playing with to get used to, and uh, sometimes you just gotta talk to the patient and figure out what's gonna work best for them. I would encourage you to play around with the, with the CPAPs that we have in the training center, um, so that way you can kinda get used to fitting it appropriately. The CPAP device that we use is called the Flow Safe 2. And this CPAP device comes with a built-in nebulizer um, that can be turned off and on throughout our patient interaction, which has really made things pretty great for us. Now, it's important to make sure that that nebulizer portion is turned off prior to putting the, the CPAP on the patient. And we make sure that the CPAP is properly placed, the patient's going to be able to tolerate the CPAP prior to utilizing the, the nebulizer portion. Now the nebulizer can be turned on by utilizing this dial right here, which is a quarter turn dial. And there is a picture on the, on the top, right up here, and on the side. And one picture means nebulize, and the other picture means just the CPAP usage, okay? Now, with that being said, when the nebulizer is not being used, air comes in through this oxygen tubing, and essentially it goes right into the CPAP, okay? Whenever we decide that we are going to utilize the nebulizer, then we turn this dial and this air now goes into the bottom of the nebulizer, okay? It goes up in and then goes into the CPAP. Now we still do have some air coming into the CPAP, but keep in mind that some of that air is going to be diverted to the bottom of the nebulizer. 
Now, when we divert some of that air to the bottom of the nebulizer, our pressure is going to drop. So in order to compensate that, we need to make sure that we increase the pressure on the tank. So if we say we start at 10 liters per minute, and we now we, we want to use the nebulizer. When we turn the dial on the nebulizer to on, we also simultaneously need to turn the pressure on the tank up. So if we start at 10, we want to maybe increase it to 12 to 15, depending on the, on the regulator. And then take a reading of the manometer and also ask the patient to make sure that that pressure is okay. With that being said, once we're done with the nebulizer and we're ready to turn off the nebulizer, we need to then make sure that we turn off the dial on the nebulizer and decrease the pressure on the oxygen tank simultaneously as well. Because if you decrease or you turn off the nebulizer but leave the tank at the 12 to 15 liters per minute, now that patient is going to be um, experiencing a huge increase in pressure. Um, it's similar to when you're pumping on RPM mode and somebody shuts down a line really, really forcefully and because there's no proper pressure relief valve set, that the other line is gonna end up getting all that pressure. It's very similar to that. So we need to make sure that we are acting as a pressure relief valve and we shut down or turn down that uh, liter flow on the regulator on the oxygen tank. Some things to keep in mind when utilizing CPAP, and some of this I've already covered, but I wanna reiterate it. CPAP may drop the patient's blood pressure. Again, when we're increasing the pressure in the chest, we're not allowing that deoxygenated venous blood from coming back into the heart as well as it, as it used to, right? So we may see a drop in blood pressure. Because of that, we need to reevaluate vital signs every five to 10 minutes to make sure that blood pressure is where it needs to be. If at any point, we apply a CPAP on the patient and now their blood pressure has dropped below 90, they are no longer a candidate for that CPAP and we need to start thinking of something else to now manage that patient. Adjust the pressure to patient comfort, but also patient improvement. So constant reassurance and talking to the patient to make sure that we're still going down the right path. And lastly, we need to plan for a decompensated patient, right? The patient may decompensate, Sometimes CPAP just does not work on some patients and they need other things like BiPAP, things that we do not have out in the field, but they have in the hospital, okay? There may be a patient that seems like a great candidate for CPAP, we apply it and they just completely decompensate, whether that means their blood pressure drops, their pulse ox drops, they become more altered, what have you, they may really, really start decompensating. Now, if we have a patient who is probably a candidate for CPAP or BiPAP, but they're not they're not handling the, the CPAP very well. The only other, other alternative is now um, ventilating the patient with a, with a bag valve mask, okay? Because if a CPAP's not working and that's helping force air into the lungs, then a non breather is not gonna work either, okay? Now we need to go to the next step, our plan B, which is actually assisting ventilations. The cool thing about the CPAP mask is, um, if we keep that mask on and attached, all we need to do is take off the actual CPAP device that attaches right here, okay? So the CPAP device typically attaches here. There's my makeshift CPAP device, okay? All we need to do is take that portion off and a BVM will actually fit right here perfectly, okay? So this is a patient who was breathing um, was having a hard time breathing, they have decompensated, they're no longer a candidate for CPAP, and now we need a more aggressive measures. The best thing to do is now ventilate this patient with a bag valve mask and assist their ventilations, okay? If we can keep them sitting up, utilize the CPAP mask. This is gonna help you um, keep that seal so that all you have to really do is now just assist their ventilations, okay? So this actually works really, really great in the field. Um, and hopefully would really start turning this patient around. The last thing I want to mention about CPAP is do not remove the CPAP if it's working, okay? We've already mentioned that it's acceptable to take it off or to change your course of action. If it's not working, the patient decompensates. But if the patient improves, we do not want to remove that CPAP. And think about this. We want the patient to improve with CPAP. If we remove the CPAP, we don't know if the patient is going to decompensate again, right? So per protocol, we are not to remove the CPAP if it's working until they get into the hospital and they can set other things up.